Dr. Hart, thank you so much for joining me. Great to be here. Why don't we start off with your background? You know, where did you get started? How did you get interested in uh, the government? And uh, where are you now? So uh, I've been interested in government actually since I was a little kid. Uh, but when I uh, was leaving grad school, my first job straight out of grad school uh, was with the White House's Office of Management and Budget, which is to me one of the most exciting places in the entire federal government because you see everything, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, the interactions with Congress, the interactions across the agencies and just the really hot button issues of the day. Uh, so I spent about a decade working over at OMB uh, on a whole variety of issues from environmental policy to uh, um, anti-poverty programs, uh, very wide ranging topics and themes. But one of the cross cutting issues that I worked on was data. Um, <clears throat> so back in 2016 and 2017, I uh, transitioned into a role as the policy director for what we call the Evidence Commission or the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking. And this was a big initiative led by uh, then House Speaker Paul Ryan and Senator Patty Murray. Uh, and it culminated in this really uh, great report that we'll talk more about that led to new law. Uh, and after that, uh, transitioned over to the nonprofit sector, uh, collaborating with industry and academics, uh, so now I lead an organization called the Data Foundation. Uh, we're a nonprofit think tank, nonpartisan, based out of Washington, D.C., that talks about data every day. We advocate and uh, conduct research on open data, evidence-informed policymaking, but specifically trying to find strategies to improve how we use data in our society, whether it's for business or, importantly, for government. So uh, you'll notice there's a little bit of a theme across a lot of the work that I've done. And so if we go back a little bit to your, your uh, graduate work, you, did your graduate work inform any of this? You know, what did you study there and where were you before that? So, um, so yes, uh, my graduate work did inform uh, a lot of the things that I have done. My, uh, my master's actually from IU, um, I studied both environmental science and policy analysis. Uh, fantastic program over at IU, uh, SPIA, uh, School of Public Environmental Affairs. And it was really uh, sort of a key step in actually going to OMB and thinking as a policy analyst. Uh, I, I sort of joked that there was a point where I wanted to be uh, an environmental advocate and SPIA helped me become an analyst, which is a different way of thinking about how you solve problems in public policy, uh, how we work with Congress to devise bipartisan and in some cases really practical solutions. It doesn't mean I, I don't care about the environment. Uh, it means that a lot of the ways that we collaborate and, and look across the, the costs and the benefits and also the solution sets have a maybe quantitative solution. Uh, but also there's a lot of practical issues that we have to navigate, including around people. And uh, those are soft skills that we teach in grad schools. Uh, so I was really thrilled to be able to bring that work when I came over to OMB. Uh, and interestingly, OMB is also why I got a PhD. Uh, I observed uh, a lot of really great work happening in government, uh, a lot of very successful programs in government during my tenure at OMB. But I also observed a lot of gaps in how we use data, or in many cases, we're not using data to evaluate the effectiveness of programs that we could be. So we collect a lot of data in our society, particularly in our government, just through the natural course of running programs, administrative records, administrative data. And uh, I was frustrated actually that we weren't conducting more evaluation of these programs. We weren't even in some cases using a lot of the data we were collecting for descriptive statistics, descriptive knowledge of what was happening to explain to the American public, this is the program that we have these are the basic characteristics of the program. And if you were interested in solving a problem, these are the range of things that we might think about doing. That's not even about the impacts or the outcomes of what the program accomplished. That's the, the very first stage things. So I went back to grad school again while I was working at OMB to try to learn how to do these things better, to understand the theories and the practice, and then brought that work back to the field. 
So uh, again, a very, very positive feedback loop. And I'd say the, the field has existed for evaluation for a very long time. Still has a long ways to go, particularly inside government, uh, but is making some great strides. So you mentioned that OMB was a good place to kind of see things happen and to get this kind of vantage point where, you know, the, the data part would become important, right? And can you explain a little bit why that is? You know, what, what role does OMB really play and what kind of influence can you have from that position in the federal government? So um, I, I'm, I'm laughing because I, I recall when I started at OMB, uh, as a as a very junior staffer, you're given an immense amount of responsibility, and it's it's because of how the organization is situated as an oversight body, a planning body, a coordinating body for the entirety of the federal government. And so, to your question, one of the reasons is there are processes that we need inside the executive branch, including because they coordinate with Congress. So things like the federal budget. And yes, the federal budget is not a perfect process, but it is a routine that exists. And because of that, there are lots of ways that information flows to Congress and to the American public that need a central coordinating body to ensure the message is consistent with the president's priorities. That's OMB's function. There's a regulatory review process that exists. And while there are a lot of uh, discussions on almost a daily basis, annual basis, about how to make that process better. It's a really important function, again, for consistency with the president's perspectives and directives. The president's the elected person inside the executive branch. Uh, and I, so I can go on, but you, you get the idea. So as a, as a staff member inside OMB, you get to see and participate in a lot of those things. But the charge is supporting ultimately the executive branch and the president's agenda. As a career staffer, that is the charge. But that can be really a, a challenging task. But one of the things that makes it so, so interesting, and I hate to use the word powerful, but like uh, I think a lot of the perspective, particularly from executive branch agencies, is these roles can be powerful, is also because some of the individuals uh, you see so much that you can connect the dots across different programs and policies. And there are so few individuals that staff the agency. It's only an agency of about 500 people for the entirety of government. Every policy, every topic that the federal government covers, there's somebody that's working on it inside this very small agency. So it's key to the successful functioning of the executive branch. But it's also key to how we think about the interactions happening across branches of government. And I think that's a really key point as we think about the future of topics around data and evidence and knowledge and integrating that for decision making. So what information does the OMB collect, I guess, when you started and then when you left uh, about, you know, the, the policy implementations and whether, you know, and how did that, that information get fed back, you know, into the priorities for the next iteration? But it's, then it's a great question. So I'll, I'll give you an example of a topic that I've, I've worked on and I've written about. Uh, one of my one of my favorite programs in the federal government is called LUST, the Leaking Underground Storage Tank Program. And uh, most people have never heard of the program in the American public, but they've experienced it because this is the program that cleans up the residual waste from uh, the underground tanks that store gasoline that are scattered around the country at sites that are often closed down. Uh, they'll have fences around them and the gasoline has seeped into the soil and cleaning up those sites is very important. When I had oversight of this program, uh, you know, we would get into these discussions about we're going to spend X million dollars, tens of millions of dollars cleaning up these sites. And it's a budgetary, it's a discretionary budget item every single year. And they would submit information about the performance measures that they would hit or aim to hit based on that information. Well, this program is implemented as a partnership with states. It's not just a federal program. It requires the states to also be supporting implementation, which also means there are a lot of other people involved in implementation, contractors, local partners, communities. So actually hitting an arbitrary number is very difficult. 
So we had to have a very long discussion about what does it mean when you set these targets and what's your evidentiary base for establishing that target? It turns out they didn't know. And this isn't a critique, this is common. So through a, because of the role at OMB and because of these, these positions and dialogues, we were able to essentially establish a process by which they conducted evaluations and learned about what exactly was driving the changes in that metric. Because it wasn't just the dollars. There was a lot that happened over time that shifted the number, including, and this is really fascinating, because of the pressure from the performance measures that were given by OMB historically in Congress, they cleaned up all the easy sites first, which meant all of the hard sites were the ones that were left. Translation, they cost more to clean up. There's going to be fewer sites to clean up in the future. So this is an example of where that program actually then, they conducted an evaluation. It, it directly informed how they implemented and explained their program to the policymakers, to the uh, appointed officials, to the elected officials at Congress for the future and talking about funding. It is a perfect example of exactly this question. OMB gets a lot of information that comes in for the budget process through uh, performance measure reporting, through evaluations, through the regulatory process. And there's a whole formal decision-making apparatus that exists around, and I'm gonna keep referring to the budget. Uh, so, you know, as, a, as an examiner, as a, as a mid-level, junior-level staffer, you're charged with sifting through all of this information and asking these hard questions of why, why this decision? If you make this trade-off, uh, are the outcomes better than these outcomes over here? And often the evaluations or the cost-effectiveness studies are not always present. So you have to use some professional judgment. You have to ask probing questions. We might have to generate new analysis to answer those questions. But that's ultimately for our senior policymakers and for Congress, what they need to know when they're making trade-offs because we don't have an infinite amount of money. These decisions are ultimately zero sum. So, you know, you basically for this particular instance, you're collecting data or information about the program or about the, the environment in which the program is working. You're trying to set some kind of targets. Um, and those are set, I'm assuming by yourselves rather than Congress is setting them. Uh, that, you know, they're giving you general guidance on what you need to do, I would guess, but they're not setting the the target. You, you're you trying to come up with some kind of incentive mechanism or target within the OMB to put pass down, right, to the to the rest of the exec, executive branch. It can be both. It can be both. So there, there are plenty of examples where Congress weighs in also on targets and goals. Uh, and so just, for example, through the appropriations process, uh, there, there are a lot of discussions that happen between the committee staff and the members and agencies. Uh, and this is the power of uh, congressional hearings. For example, when a cabinet secretary or an appointed official goes to a hearing on the appropriations that are being requested or the, the president's budget requests, and they might be asked about particular outcomes or uh, performance measures in a program. And this is not uncommon. Now, yes, there, there may be politics that are involved in those hearings for sure, but there are a lot of members that are distinctly interested in programs that are priorities for them, what's happening. And so when the agencies are submitting their formal documentation for a budget, they're also providing a lot of information. And it is a ton of information about what's happening and what's expected to happen with future resources. So there, there are a lot of public discussions, but there's also a lot of behind the scenes. And I would say this is very productive discussions about you know, what do you think you're going to accomplish with this amount of resources? So the appropriations staff, and in some cases, the individual office staff can have tremendous influence and in really encouraging and facilitating stronger performance of programs, because when executive branch agencies know this is a priority for our appropriations staff, that actually lights a little bit of a fire and generates some extra incentive for an agency to prioritize. Does it always work? Well, you know, we could evaluate that. Uh, but I'd say you know, knowing something as a priority goes a really long ways when it when it comes to implementation, including when agencies are internally allocating resources. So I guess that information from Congress can come in the form of either the law itself or uh, or it can come through the kind of the hearing process, which is a little bit more formal. If you if you're getting pointed questions about particular issues, that can be a signal. And then I know that there are individual members of Congress can write letters, et cetera, 
um, about particular programs. So I'm assuming that that's kind of like the one way communication from from Congress to the to the agency now or, or to OMB or to any other part of the federal government or to the executive branch. So what about the information flow from OMB to Congress, right? So obviously there's the budget, which is sent, right? But, uh, you know, yeah. can you talk about how that, is it, is it adversarial? Is it, we, we're a closed shop. We're only going to respond to what's, you know, subpoenaed. Is it, you know, collaborative? Is it everything we see, you can see, you know, how does that play out? And is it change over time, depending on the administration? Uh, so this is a harder question to answer than you might think, uh, because it, there's there's not really one single answer. Uh, it's episodic. It evolves over time. It has uh, uh, varied based on who's in what position, uh, including congressional affairs offices. It sometimes varies based on who knows who, uh, relationships and individual programs. But I, I think at a macro level, the, the best way to summarize this is there are there are different branches of government. And so there is some institutional divide that is necessary and real, but also perhaps too extensive. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge that exists in the executive branch that Congress needs and must rely on in order to do its job well. However, there's a tension on the executive branch side and often sharing too much of that knowledge because of fear. And that fear comes in lots of different ways. It might be fear about what will happen with a budget. It might be fear about different levels of workload. It might be fear of uncertainty. And to give credit to the folks in the executive branch, often those fears are merited. Those fears are not just against Congress though. Those fears also exist for OMB. So OMB has many of these same tensions actually in working with the executive branch itself. And so one of the really key points, uh, just from my observations in the last decade in particular, are building collaborative relationships while very, very difficult is so essential to get this right. Uh, while at OMB, and the example that I gave you around uh, leaking underground storage tanks, is a really good model of where a program office and a, uh, the budget function and the evaluation team recognized how to collaborate very well with OMB. There are also examples of where agencies know how to collaborate incredibly effectively with the Congress and can have open and, and honest dialogues about how to make programs better, but without getting beat over the head. Um, but I also know examples of where agencies have disagreements across, you know, the Department of Education and OMB and second, a few, a few other agencies. And this is another tension point in how the executive branch as a body, as an as a entire branch of government communicates with Congress, is that if it doesn't have a single voice, there's sometimes a perspective that it can't communicate at all. And and this is my, my personal perspective, that can be very dangerous because then Congress actually isn't getting any information to make decisions. Uh, just meeting with the congressional staffer yesterday on a major reauthorization that is coming down the pike and the administration has not provided any technical assistance formally on that piece of legislation. And it, it is perplexing because they have huge there are huge equities for the entirety of the executive branch in that. And my, my assumption, I do not know this for a fact, is that it is because there are so many different perspectives, the executive branch is still trying to reconcile what its views are. So this is just an example of perhaps we should explore other processes for communicating how views are conveyed including by having relationships with key staffers. So they know they're not out there in the ether uh, they, they know that they have support and can ask key questions, uh, get advice and expertise from those who know the programs the best, who are the people, the civil servants who are implementing them on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's talk more about this notion of um, evidence-based policy, right? So this is a big focus of yours. Um, you dedicate a lot of time and energy to it. What it, let's start with the fundamental meaning, if you don't mind. Like, what does that actually mean? And then let's dig a little bit into what it means for Congress. 
So there, there are a lot of views on the concept of evidence-based policy. Uh, the concept has been around for really generations. I mean, actually, since the beginning of this country, we built into the Constitution the idea that we collect data on our population. So we know how many people we have. We design districts for voting purposes around this idea. That is the fundamental of evidence-based policymaking, that you have some information that informs a decision that guides how we exist as a society. The challenge is what is evidence and how do you use it for informing the policy? Increasingly, we've adapted into a term called evidence-informed policymaking, not evidence-based policymaking, because one of the nuances is this perception and belief that you can have a policy that is exclusively based on the evidence, which is flawed. Uh, we're in a democratic society in the United States, and we will always have a lot of very valuable inputs for how we make policy. Uh, in Congress, one of those will always be the value system of the individual members. One of those will be how members come together to generate compromise or negotiate. Um, and there are a lot of factors that affect that. The key that we have when we talk about evidence-informed policy is we want the evidence to have a seat at the table. We need the knowledge and the expertise that is built around science and data and knowledge to be informing these discussions in a coherent, logical, rational way. We also need that evidence to be reliable and valid. So these are key constructs in the scientific community that have existed for generations. There's also a very robust discussion about what exactly that means. What are the methods, what are the techniques, what are the approaches? And what is important is that we not get lost in the methodological discourse as we're trying to build a better society and solve real problems. We will always have a lot of very complex and useful methods to answer these wicked challenges that are ahead of us. What we wanna do is bring this full range of methods to bear. Uh, at the beginning of this administration, the, the Biden administration, uh, President Biden issued a memo to executive branch agencies on evidence-based policymaking. And it actually includes this little paragraph that probably got missed by almost everyone in the American public, except for the, the nerds like me, that noticed it actually includes this huge range of methodological approaches when talking about evidence. Uh, ethnographers must be really excited because they got a shout out in this memo. It wasn't just about qual quantitative methods. Uh, and the point here is uh, we need all of these approaches to knowledge generation to support our policymaking community today. So support the policymaking community is the key thing. This is about using evidence to make better decisions and uh, Policymakers are not homogenous. There's not a single way to think about a decision maker today. So how do we then take this evidence and make it useful? That is the great challenge in evidence-informed and evidence-based policymaking is taking the evidence that we have and connecting the dots across this policy process that is uh, often frantic uh, even though we have these very clear processes that might exist for making decisions, at the end of the day, there are limits to knowledge, there are limits to time, there, we're pulling together information in new ways, we're looking at new solution sets. So how do you take that evidence and apply it in the right framework? And there's a lot of, a lot of ways that we do that we can talk more about. The challenge with the methodological discussion is that, you know, you can create a methodology to create any kind of data you want, right, that would either support or... Uh, that would show a, a particular policy that would probably be a success or a failure, <clears throat> depending upon your methodological uh, choice. You know, the same issue, you know, of course, crops up in science, uh, you know, in uh, in discussions of what can be reproduced, et cetera. But if we just go back to like the fundamental um, idea of evidence policy, you know, evidence-based policy making, you know, I, can, to me, I can see kind of two different scenarios. One is you have a policy already exists. Right. And we're assessing whether it's working or not. Right. Uh, exactly. and, and or it's it's achieving its original objective, shall we say. Uh, and then there's another one where you're creating a new policy. Right. I want to do something new. And, um, you know, in, in that case, it's, uh, you know, you, you have to find data for that. You know, in terms of the policies that already exist, you know, if, if we break it down, you know, on the one side, 
um, you know, when the policy was originally conceived, you know, they had a notion of what would have been success, right? Uh, now, to me, it's always surprising they don't bake in those measures into the policy so that they could be then easily measured. But, you know, you, you put X dollars to some program that you think will have, that you want to solve some problem, right? Uh, now, how does evidence-based policy fit factor there, right? Like, for the Congress, right? You know, it it tells the agency to go do something, go, you know, solve poverty or preserve the environment or do X, Y, or Z, but they don't specify exactly in the policy what success or failure of that program. So how do you think about this kind of issue? Do you think some of these like measurements should be baked into the policy themselves and then an apparatus should be there to measure it? Or do you think that's something that should happen after the policy has been implemented and then feed that back to the Congress to, to decide whether it's successful or not. We need clear goals. And this is a challenge often as we look at programs to evaluate them. And it is not a critique of Congress. It is a consequence of negotiation and maybe even one of the successes of passing legislation. We have hundreds, thousands of examples of programs that have multiple goal statements, uh, and in some cases, conflicting goals. What does it mean to address poverty, if that's your goal? Are you increasing jobs? Are you addressing food insecurity? If you write a piece of legislation that covers multiple themes, then how do you evaluate it based on those? What are your primary outcomes that you're evaluating? Uh, a few years ago, um, there was an evaluation of a piece of legislation called the Second Chance Act. Uh, and it was a priority for a number of members of Congress. The evaluation results were overwhelmingly uh, underwhelming for the primary outcomes that were written into the law. But there were secondary outcomes that they were overwhelmingly positive for. So what do you do with that? If, if you're a legislator, that's looking and saying, well, the, the whole point of this program was to reduce recidivism, but we didn't really do that. But actually we increased employment. That's great. Should we reauthorize this program? Well, that's actually a pretty tough question if you have to find the money to reauthorize it. <laughs> but this is a great example of, you know, sometimes we learn new things as we go. And actually that was an example of where through the course of looking at the evaluation, we also looked at other things where you could say, okay, well, maybe we need to improve the technical assistance. And you learn those kinds of things through qualitative research, not the quantitative research. And you can change the design and the program design to build a better boat or build a bigger boat, uh, right? So um, I, I think the, the way to think about this is we, we do need to be very deliberate in program design. That's not all on Congress. A lot of this is on the executive branch. And uh, the intent in Congress passing the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act back in 2018, it became a law in 2019, we call it the Evidence Act for short, was to actually build this better system, to change the culture of how agencies are thinking about evaluation and design of their programs. We have a long ways to go Believe me, a long ways to go, but there is this emerging body of work, uh, emerging culture inside the agencies that is now beginning to have what I'm gonna call evaluative thinking much more deliberately. So what that means is uh, in part because there are now evaluation officers across the large agencies, they have principles and practices for conducting evaluation, their standards, uh, there are now expectations that we're doing things like asking about the logic models and the theories of change of programs, whether they've been around for a hundred years or one year, we're deliberately planning for these theories of change so that we can also conduct evaluations. We're also um, building out what we're calling multi-year evidence building plans. It's a mouthful. We're learning agendas. And this is a way of asking the big questions that we want answers to, but also having a little humility about what we don't know. So this is actually a core concept in evidence-based policymaking of connecting the dots between the supply of information and knowledge to the eventual users and the demand function. And if we can better address what the users and the policymakers actually want to use, my God, we can actually encourage a cycle that facilitates evidence-informed policymaking. 
But the, the learning agendas are this key way of us supporting exactly this question, which is identifying the knowledge gaps and then in partnership with academia, nonprofits, uh, even the private sector, trying to answer those questions as best as we can. It might require new data collection. It might require sharing data across uh, executive branch agencies that already have it. It might be partnerships with the private sector to facilitate bringing in data that the private sector is collecting that the government just doesn't have that we can do in a secure and, and privacy protected way to generate the knowledge that Congress needs. This is yeah, a, so this actually, is a wicked wanna... problem. Yeah, I'd like to get into more of the data question in a minute, but I'm curious about your perspective on the on the legislative process, right? So, when I think about the legislative process, I'm 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 very tempted by this concept that the goal of the policy needs to be very clearly stated, and there need to be a number of measures that the policy, you know, the actual law would outline to say, you know, these are the data we're going to collect. This is how we're going to measure the outcome, and if it doesn't reach that outcome you know, project self-destructs, right? You know, that's a, a strong temptation. And as an investor, you know, I'd want to have that same thing, right? I invest in a business, you know, I'm I'm looking for X percent return. You tell me you're going to do X, Y, and Z. I'm buying into that, that story, right? And if you don't get the return, well, then it hasn't been a success. Or if you exceed that return, then it's been a, then it is success, right? And I, maybe I want to invest more. So, to me, it sounds like front loading the legislative process with more specific kind of goals and data collection methodologies and measurements would seem to be the way um, rather than to have, you know, the agency decide then what those things are. But I can understand they don't necessarily have the expertise, you know, the the policy debate gets really diff difficult, you know, there's specifics in there. You know, what's your perspective on where that setting should happen? So my perspective is Congress should set the expectations, but should refrain generally from over-specifying. And the reason is legislation is hard to pass. So just an example, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program is this vital subsidy that we provide to state and local governments that supports uh, heating assistance and cooling assistance and some weatherization activities uh, across the country, critical needs for low-income households. If Congress was to write into that law, its authorization tomorrow, that you must serve a certain number of households, what it would essentially do is tie the hands of those at the state level for maximizing for who needs the benefits the most based on local knowledge and context. What it would also potentially miss are what we call mediating factors. So something like uh, there is a recession. Congress passes a uh, emergency supplemental funding pool of billions of extra dollars for the program. Well, did they actually achieve their performance because of that original target? No, they did it because of the other thing. So there's a lot of um, cautions that I would flag for over-specifying in legislation. The one thing that I can very clearly say is Congress must set the expectations for driving performance. What we know from the field and from the research and everything that we've been doing in evidence-based policymaking for decades, leadership really matters. And leadership comes in lots of different ways, but the expectations that come from congressional champions on particular topics, allies from congressional staff, and even the staff that just ask a question inside the executive branch, that always matters. Because then they have a reason to be able to have conversations about whatever that question or topic is, including if they're really hard questions to answer. So if the staffer or the member says, why aren't you hitting X target? Why didn't you clean up 10,000 sites? Why didn't you serve 100,000 households? The agency has to have a conversation about that and may even have to have a formal response. That's different than putting it in the authorization and then having a hammer to say, if you don't hit that target, we're going to cut you off. The last thing that I'll say is there actually is a mechanism that we can lean on that does a little bit of this. In 2010, Congress reauthorized a law called the Government Performance and Results Act. It's called the GIPRA Modernization. And agencies now do quarterly reporting to OMB. And some of those metrics then make it over to Congress. And the intent was that we set the highest priority goals for our entire government. 
and say, these are the things that matter the most to the American people. These are the things that align the most with executive branch strategic priorities. And this is where we've received input from Congress about what their biggest priorities are. So it's not everything that exists across the federal government, but top priorities. When agencies don't hit those goals, it really matters. It forces conversations and it actually has a consequence built into the law if you don't hit a certain number of those. So there are some mechanisms that we can also look at for the key priorities, but in terms of a general protocol, expectations is what I would sort of lean on in terms of encouraging and facilitating a better dialogue here. So when you say that the the exe- you know the um, <clears throat> Congress should set goals, you think it shouldn't be specific quantitative goals, or you think it should be according to a policy? It depends. Um, not to give you a wishy-washy answer, but it depends. You know, if if Congress is going to um, allocate a billion dollars for a weatherization program or uh, loan guarantees and give out a hundred billion dollars, it should be able to set some general expectation about the, the goal that it's hoping to accomplish based on that allocation of resources. And that's no different than what OMB would do in working and collaborating with an agency. The, the hammer that we might think about on the other side of that is a, a honest discussion about, did you achieve the number of widgets? But I'm gonna, I'm gonna be very clear here, that's an outcome, or that's an output, not an outcome. What we're actually interested in is, did we improve energy efficiency? Did we improve the capital market as a consequence of using those two examples that I just gave? Those are very different things that you need to analyze than just counting the beans and counting the widgets. And that's why the evaluation function is so important as we have this conversation, because what we actually want to do is not just produce the thing, we want to drive outcomes and improve outcomes and impact for the American people. That's what Congress is there for. So let's move now to the the concept of information feedback from basically measuring those outputs and outcomes, right? Uh, so, you know, you can re- Congress could rely on the executive branch to supply that information, which it typically does, right? But that's always surprised me. I always thought, you know, why doesn't Congress have a its own kind of like con- it doesn't even have to be a, a government owned entity. You could contract with some corporation to collect outcomes data, right, uh, for each policy uh, or count the number of widgets rather than rely on the manufacturer, which is the executive branch, right? To me, it seems like a major conflict of interest for the executive branch to be reporting the information to the legislative branch. Now, I understand why it's the case, you know, they have better access, et cetera. uh, But I've always been surprised at how little Congress relies on third parties to collect systematic information about policy outcomes and policy either outcomes or uh, or the widgets, you know, at the actual outputs. So what's your perspective on that? You know, do you think that makes sense? Or do you think the executive branch is the right, uh, the right method to collect the information for Congress? It depends. <laughs> um, so there are some mechanisms that exist today that are dual reporting functions to both Congress and the executive branch. The example, the most obvious example is the inspectors general. Uh, and in 2008, we reformed, uh, and this is the, Claire McCaskill as a senator champion this work, uh, the IG Reform Act uh, at the time uh, put in this door reporting function and it's uh, created this mechanism by which uh, the IGs, while they're situated within the executive branch, have very clear lines of communication and independence in discussing what's happening inside agencies with uh, the Congress. Uh, Increasingly, IGs have built out program audit functions that are consistent with the Government Accountability Office's, what they call the Yellow Book, a set of standards about independence. Um, That's actually a really important mechanism for providing some oversight and feedback, but it's not quite the same thing. Uh, It's not necessarily doing impact evaluations and long-term outcome evaluations of programs, which is what I think you're ultimately asking about. Um, In in my perspective, a very well-designed evaluation function that's consistent with the principles and practices of the field, the standards from the American Evaluation Association, um, can be really effective inside the executive branch. And there are risks to duplicating too much activity. And this is not just a statement about costs, that's a real implication. 
Uh, there are also risks because we might overwhelm the people that we need to participate in the process to get information to do an evaluation. So an example, if I was interested in conducting a study of um, education outcomes at the local level in the state of Missouri, and I needed to survey uh, 30 school systems in the state of Missouri, and Congress was also doing the same basic analysis, uh, I'm probably going to drive attrition in the responses uh, just by going back to the same school systems, which is actually going to diminish the quality of both of the reports, not just one of them. So as a consequence of directing one place to do the evaluation or the other, we actually probably get better knowledge. Now this is, a, I realize this is a little bit of a blanket statement and a hypothetical, but genuinely when we concentrate the expertise and the knowledge in the evaluation community, uh, my perspective is we're probably getting better evaluations as a consequence. Now, having said all of that, Congress needs to be able to provide adequate oversight. So if there are perspectives that it's not getting the evaluations and the quality of an analysis from the executive branch, that's something that we need to look at. A couple of years ago, the House Modernization Committee held a hearing explicitly on data and evidence. And this was a question that they were exploring about how they better organize to uh, essentially answer these hard questions. Uh, and it was not just about relying on executive branch information. There are lots of places that we gather insights, uh, could be from the private sector, could be from academia, or could be the institution itself. And Congress has some great agencies that it relies on within the legislative branch today that can still be stronger. And I think if we can't say that out loud, we, we aren't being honest, those institutions must be stronger to support Congress, and then what? Uh, there is, as you're saying, there's no clear evaluative function inside the legislative branch. So uh, one of the discussion points that came out of that hearing with the House Modernization Committee was simply, should Congress have a chief data officer as a way of organizing its work better? Uh, and there's been legislation recently filed uh, as a resolution for Congress to establish a congressional evidence commission as a way of better looking at itself to actually answer this exact question. Yeah, I think Congress looking at itself is a is a very important question. Um, but in this case, we're talking about it's, you know, the Congress's, you know, policy outcomes in the world. You know, I wonder, you know, like I mean, one of the examples I think about is uh, the wait, light, wait times of the VA. You know, this was a scandal a while back, right? Um, where the agency presumably wasn't reporting it to Congress what the wait times were or didn't know or, or if it knew it didn't it didn't report those. Uh, and then the individual Congress, uh, individual members were receiving, you know, you know, uh, complaints about wait times. But of course, they didn't coordinate that information internally. It was like everybody was getting their own thing and they would call the VA about their specific issues. And then they, it wasn't coordinated. And, uh, and, and this to me seems like a, the perfect example of where why don't you have some kind of third party, you know, market research firm just poll those people who are at the at the VA uh, and about their experience of the VA. And that there's a third party providing you information about outcomes, right? Of a particular policy, you know? So I, I wonder, you know, obviously the executive branch, you know, maybe collects some of this data, maybe it doesn't, but you would think that Congress might um, be able to create a more systematic data collection apparatus that would more closely align with the outcomes it's trying to create. Um, it sounds like your, your view is there could be a mix. I, on a topic like what you're you're offering for customer ex or for veterans uh, experiences, I think there certainly could be a mix. And the VA may not agree with me on that statement, but uh, I'd also be remiss to not acknowledge the VA has made tremendous progress on exactly this issue in recent years. They created the Veterans Health Customer Experience. Uh, there's an entire program that exists, an office that exists at the VA that's deliberately and intentionally exploring ways to reduce wait times, improve that experience, the front door exposure, uh, navigating the hospitals. And they've allocated a tremendous amount of resources to this. It's not perfect, uh, but there are other agencies that are also doing the same. Uh, the IRS, uh, which actually was much a credit to Congress allocating resources and setting expectations through an authorizing statute that they do this. Um, dramatically reduced the wait times in the last filing season for how long people got stuck on hold. 
Uh, and it was from like, in just this excessive amount of time to something like four minutes. And, and they did that by using things that exist in the private sector, callbacks. It was, it was not a, a revolutionary system. It was by thinking about from a human-centered design, the customer, the American public. At the heart of all of these things, by the way, is data. And I mean, this is the core of what we have to be able to, to think about and encourage for the Congress and the executive branch is how we're better using our data to answer and even identify these kinds of problems on the front end. So this is, this is exactly the point. If Congress doesn't have the, uh, the business intelligence to be able to identify those problems, or if the executive branch doesn't have the humility because of a number of reasons, and not this is not a critique, but it could be the fear of the budgets, the fear of the consequences, the messaging. If it can't, with humility, say, this is a problem, we need to collaborate and identify how to solve it, that's an issue. So let's talk more then about the data side. You've started the, the data, you're, you're running this data foundation. I mean, can you talk through what it's doing and then how it sounds like what you're trying to do and you tell me, but uh, you're trying to create this kind of transparency of data uh, from government that can be fed back into this evidence-based process. That, that's exactly right. So um, our core is around advocating for open data, evidence-informed policymaking. But what that really means is that we're working in collaboration between private sector, um, nonprofits, and government itself to build a better system for actually using data. And so that has a lot of intersections. One of our major themes is actually supporting capacity building. So we collaborate a lot with the chief data officers, the evaluation officials, the statistical officials that are scattered around the executive branch. Uh, we work a lot with congressional committees and identifying and often communicating where the opportunities are for establishing data standards, uh, improving the quality of information that exists or could exist to solve some of these big problems. Uh, just last Congress, there was a great bipartisan effort for something that had been underway for many years. Uh, since the 2008 uh, economic crisis, uh, we've been talking about how to improve financial data in our country. And in many cases, it's data that's already submitted to the government, uh, but submitted in a way that is not actually useful uh, through forms, sometimes static PDFs. Uh, so a, a great bipartisan effort led by Senator Warner, Senator Crapo on the House side, uh, Congressman McHenry and uh, former Congresswoman Maloney, uh, led to the Financial Data Transparency Act, FDTA. And it essentially suggested to the financial regulators, you should work together and establish a common data standard and reporting scheme to improve the information that's available to you and also to the American public. <laughs> And it sounds so simple, probably to a lot of uh, the American public that would hear me say a statement like that. But it's in practice something that is so hard to implement because individual agencies have individual missions and purposes. And sometimes we miss those opportunities for cross collaboration. And this is the exact opportunity for Congress, when I get back to that statement about expectations and goals, can help identify where those opportunities for collaboration are. Congress put in a piece of legislation, it's a very simple piece of legislation at the end of the day, that says these agencies should work together and it will vastly improve what we know and have information that also benefits the private sector and investors ultimately once it's fully implemented. Those are the kinds of things that we work on because they're these big wicked challenges that need an advocate when it comes to data. So we conducted research over uh, many years related to supporting that, provide technical assistance, and then help bring the right people into the same room. So one of our values is what we like to say, uh, radical collaboration. Uh, we have a belief that if you can bring uh, people who are willing to work together into a room together, you're gonna get a better solution. Uh, it might be members of Congress, but it could also be industry, academia, nonprofit, and the government actually having that conversation together. And we've seen this come to fruition in many cases. So you're trying to get government to not only create information that's useful for itself and everybody else, but also kind of create standards, uh, you know, that 
that make it sort of interoperable, I should, we could say, or reduce duplication or reduce confusion among what the different agencies are creating. You, you got it. Uh, interoperability is a major theme. Burden reduction is a major theme. Uh, and increased insights and knowledge ultimately being an outcome. So financial services sounds like a, a win that you've got. Um, and that's great, you know, because I think uh, it's so important for the financial markets, right, to have this kind of standardization and transparency, right? It, it, it underlies the market and it underlies the regulator's ability to make sure that it's operating um, in the right way. You know, in terms of other areas, what are your other priorities besides the financial services area? So we are um, we are generalists in the sense that the Data Foundation we work on the topic of data and the topic of evidence, which is not how most of Washington D.C.'s think tanks are organized. A lot of our peers are organized around particular policy domains: education, public health, financial services. We also work on all of those topics. Uh, so we're we're grateful to have support from a number of philanthropic foundations, uh, a number of our uh, industry partners, and uh, we we do a lot of work on public health data sharing, particularly uh, during the pandemic. Um, we are uh, working on things like uh, Ezra, the Education Science Reform Act, uh, in in the education space. And uh, one of our earliest uh, 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 areas that we focused on as an organization, actually at its inception, was about government spending data, uh, which is its own domain uh, in, in a really interesting way. So there was a law called the Data Act uh, back a decade ago, uh, or almost a decade ago, that was enacted that has vastly improved the knowledge that the American public and Congress have about what government's actually spending. All it did at its core was establish a data standard in the federal government for spending information. It was hard to implement, but conceptually a very simple uh, uh, piece of legislation, huge bipartisan effort. And it's why now you can go online and go to usaspending.gov and have much more consistency and better quality information about what your government's actually spending money on. Uh, we know congressional staff are using this uh, as a resource to um, support appropriations processes and hearings, uh, delve into what agencies are actually working on a little bit further than the congressional justifications that they receive. Uh, but these are all areas that uh, as an organization, we've worked to support over uh, nearly a decade. You know, the government spending one is an interesting case because, you know, on the one side you have what the government actually spends on, say, on a line by line basis. And then you have what Congress is, in theory, authorized or appropriated. Uh, and the connection between those two things, I think, is still not clear. Have you <laughs> looked into that, how that can be tied all the way through uh, from, you know, the actual law to the actual dollar? We have, uh, and it is complicated to take the budget account level information and sometimes match it to the appropriation controls and then continue distilling at a level that is useful for evaluative purposes. So typically when we're conducting an evaluation of a grant, you need to know something about the grantee. When we provide an appropriation, that's not the level of funding that we're looking at. We're way up at the uh, all of the grantees aggregated together, or in some cases, multiple grant programs grouped together for what we call a budget account. Uh, that's a lot of summary level information. So I think there was a belief very early on that the, the Data Act, this uh, ability to standardize some of the information, would immediately lead to better evaluation activities. In practice, we haven't really seen that. And this is, this is just a very honest statement. It, it has not led to stronger evaluations of outcomes, but that doesn't mean it can't. It means that we have more work to do. Uh, a couple of years ago, Congress passed another piece of legislation that related called the GREAT Act, which was actually about improving the outcome information we we're collecting on grants and cooperative agreements. And that's the next step. Once that is implemented, we'll be able to better connect the dots across some government spending to have a much more granular perspective. And there are some of the executive branch agencies that are currently exploring how to better distill this information and make it available in their own systems for their own evaluation purposes 
for their own program administrators. And then eventually that'll have a nice transparency effect both for Congress and the American public. For the most part, that's very difficult to find today. Uh, but that was another example of a great bipartisan piece of legislation led by Congresswoman Virginia Fox, uh, one of her major priorities at the time. So from your perspective, like when we talk about transparency coming out of the government, you know, on the one side, you know, I'm a bit conflicted because obviously the, the citizens are paying for everything. And so they should be able to get the information about what's where that money is flowing ultimately and, you know, who is where and everything that happens. On the other side, there are concerns about privacy. There are concerns about, you know, if you itemized everything to every, you know, authorizer inside the, the, the executive branch, you'd know what every manager spent on everything. And, you know, that brings up privacy concerns. There's national security concerns. There's all kinds of other issues. So I, got, I guess I have two questions for you related to the transparency. At what level do you think it needs to go? Right? How granular should the transparency be? And is there a principle on which you, need, you can base that? And the second one is, in what form should it be made transparent? Like you can imagine it, it creates a big Excel file that it, it dumps out every day, right? And then everyone can consume this Excel file, this SQL or this massive database, or it can go through all the process of creating all the charts and graphs that interpret all that data and make that available to the citizen. And it can build a bunch of front end uh, technology. So I guess there's two fundamental questions related to the transparency. To what level and in what form? So this may sound counterintuitive, but I am both a transparency advocate and a privacy advocate. And the reality is we need both. And they are not as much of a dueling perspective as we are often led to believe. Uh, you can also do both at the same time. Uh, the work of the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking actually makes exactly this point, that uh, we collect a lot of inherently confidential, restricted information that is necessary to keep confidential for the purposes of maintaining trust, but also respecting the privacy of individual people and businesses across the country. However, we also want to be able to share the insights of that information. And so we go through a process that's called de-identification uh, and make different levels of that information publicly accessible or restricted access accessible. And there's the concept that we are using called tiered access. So it might be that one version of a data set or, or data file is made fully and openly, freely available to the American public as open data, fully open data. And it might be that another version is only made available to a researcher who has uh, sworn a, a pledge to uphold uh, privacy protections, which also carry criminal and civil liabilities for uh, violating. We actually have those mechanisms in existence today. Uh, Congress reauthorized uh, one of the really important laws, by the way, back in 2018 that maintains some of those protections inside the executive branch in a really bipartisan fashion. So this, this balance is really key in answering your question. And when it comes to thinking about an important topic like a grant, we also have to be able to protect this balance because there are grantees that are also working on sensitive topics and that might have inherent information about business or confidential business information that cannot actually be released under existing privacy laws. So we have to have the processes and procedures in place to protect that information but the dollar value of the grant, the fact that they received the grant is also inherently governmental. So ensuring that we're clear in issuing the guidance and the protocols is essential. This is a role actually for OMB. Uh, OMB has a grants office that provides this guidance uh, through uh, circulars and other formats, memos uh, to executive branch agencies and can help coordinate all of these things. But as we think about what knowledge we need and how to balance the transparency and the privacy dynamics, the real answer to your question is, it's what people want and need that we agree to in policymaking and society that answer the question. What does Congress need and what do they want? If Congress passed a law today and it was signed, or passed a bill today and it was signed by the president that said every grantee must report X, Y, and Z and it was upheld, that would be the answer to the question. That's a societal determination that notwithstanding your objections about privacy, we've determined that something needs to be made transparently available. And we've done exactly this in lots of cases. 
the Paycheck Protection Act uh, or program, Paycheck Protection Program that was part of the emergency supplemental a few years ago, provided lots of loan information that was, that was granted and then forgiven uh, to businesses and nonprofits across the country. And in many cases, we would have considered that confidential business information for a generation. I'm a nonprofit executive. Uh, you can find my salary online on the IRS website. Under Title 26, everyone else's wages and earnings in the entire country are protected. We've made a societal determination that information is different. Those are exceptions. And this is the exact conversation that Congress needs to have in a really important way about how we balance the privileged information and what needs to be transparent. And so then how about the, the other question about in what form, right? Because you can imagine the government has a big API and then any organization, you know, uh, can build tools and analytics and visualizations on top of that. Uh, on the other hand, the government could spend millions, if not billions of dollars to build its own kind of analytics and, and things on top of it that, you know, may or may not go out of fashion within five years, you know, that's kind of thing. So where do you see the government's um, responsibility in, is it to release the data or is it to release the data in a form that, you know, is very easy to understand? Accessibility is a key role of government and determining particularly for the information that government is collecting on behalf of, behalf of its population, how and what information to, to make it accessible. The tools by which access is made for the American public is a whole separate conversation. We know, and there are just loads of examples of this, that government APIs are not always as effective as people want them to be. And this is not a critique of the, the really brilliant civil servants who are designing them. This is a critique of the bureaucratic and technocratic processes that we have inside government that sometimes delay the development and design of things like an API or uh, may inhibit updates and modifications. An alternative strategy is to work in collaboration with those who have much more flexibility. If we can make accessible data for the private sector working in partnership with government, we also capture something called innovation that can happen very fast. And this is not to say that government itself is not innovative. It's to say that, and one of my values for my organization is radical collaboration. We believe that if you take the best in both worlds, you actually get better ideas and better solutions. So let's do that. Let's make the data accessible and capture the one of the great benefits of what's happening in the private sector, innovation. So before we move on to the next phase of our discussion, I just want to go back to the um, the evidence based policy making for a moment, you know, and and kind of get some final thoughts on that. So where do you think we are in terms of the state of play, if you will, of the of evidence based policy making? Where do you see it kind of evolving in the next five to ten years? So January of 2024 is the five year anniversary of the Evidence Act. And we have made tremendous progress as a country in changing the way that we think about this topic in our federal agencies. And that has had a cascade effect for state and local, tribal uh, institutions. Um, but we have a long ways to go. That law is not being fully implemented, which means we haven't fully addressed the culture change that was envisioned in government. There's an entire title of the law around open data for which there is still not guidance from the executive branch. Uh, which means some of these important questions around how we're making data accessible to the American public have major gaps. So, long way to say. We have a, a long road ahead. But because we've made so much progress and we've built on this strong foundation over the last 40 and 50 years, I think that's also the catalyst for more change in the years ahead and improvement. We're starting to see members of Congress ask more for evidence in hearings. And it's not necessarily the one-sided, you know, I, I need the evidence that validates my perspective. They're open-ended questions. Uh, we're seeing the congressional staff have conversations with the chief data officers and, and explicitly asking in the budget process for more evidence. OMB is in turn including more evidence in its budget requests as in working with agencies. Uh, we're seeing evaluation plans and actual products for evaluations increase across the executive branch. The system's getting better. And uh, is it going to be perfect tomorrow? Absolutely not. But on net, we are making really great improvements. So I think that's the encouraging thing about the years ahead. 
And what we, I think, need and hopefully can sustain is that enthusiasm for continued improvement and build out some demonstrated and successful use cases at a high level uh, with the champions on the Hill who are actually talking about this as part of those major reauthorizations and ensure that this isn't just a weapon during budget discussions. And I'll just be a little honest, that's probably the most dangerous thing when we talk about evidence is that somebody says, oh, this didn't work, let's cut the budget uh, because nobody will come back the second time. Are, are there any foreign uh, countries that um, have led the way in this area uh, and that are potential models, at least in particular aspects of policy? Or is this something where we're sort of striking out uh, and, uh, and breaking new ground. We are definitely at the forefront of the international um, domain in, in this, this conversation. Um, there were a lot of countries that looked at the US Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking as a model, and were intrigued by the very honest conversations we were having about the need for better data sharing as a society and the importance around privacy protections and this was well ahead of the emergence of the popular discourse around artificial intelligence. Having said that, there are lots of countries that are also doing incredibly well. Uh, a lot of Western uh, uh, countries in Europe, for example, United Kingdom, Netherlands, are models that we've also looked back at uh, for things that they're exploring, particularly around knowledge brokering. Um, Japan has a process that actually looks very similar to our evidence commission. Uh, so there are plenty of places around the world that are also exploring similar themes and trying to figure out how to make their public administration and uh, their respective legislative and executive processes work better. Excellent. Well, I think it's time for us to move on to phase two, where I ask you questions that I've asked all the guests so we can compare the answers uh, in the future. So are you ready for the next step? Let's do it. All right. Well, the next question is, what do you think congressional representation should mean? And so this I mean, you know, your your personal opinion on does a member represent, you know, their primary voters, everybody in their district, future generations, you know, who are their actual constituents? Uh, I'm a believer that representation means you represent everybody in your district, whether they vote for you or not, uh, but also are mindful of what's coming down the pike. I have a five-year-old son, and I like to believe that we're also planning for his future just as much as we're planning for our current state of the world. And how about the way that they would represent, you know, are they, are the representatives supposed to just reflect the views of that majority inside their district, or are they making their own independent judgments about what's in the best interest of the, of those constituents in the long run? It's a mix. And uh, in, in my perspective, uh, you cannot be an effective member of Congress without knowing and understanding the context of your district. However, Members of Congress also get unique context by being members of Congress. Uh, they have access to information and staff that are working and learning new things that may not be information that we uh, widely disseminate. Uh, we have a whole classified infrastructure in government and there are lots of things that we know about classified government if you're part of that uh, uh, part of government that aren't known widely to the American public for a reason. And what we need to ensure is that we have trust that our elected officials are responsible stewards of information like that. So it has to be a mix in my opinion. Right, next question is how would your ideal Congress allocate its time? And by that, I mean, should they spend all day uh, in all year long in Washington? Should they spend it all back in their districts and spend one day in Washington a year? Should they be in committees or should they be dialing for dollars? How would you break their time down if you could, if you could uh, tell them what to do? Uh, well, I, I will never pretend to be able to tell them what to do. Uh, just to, just to say that uh, it would not be dialing for dollars. Uh, and I mean, I'm a champion here of, of evidence and, I mean, certainly also a little bit realistic that members are time constrained and will not be sitting around reading academic journals to gather new evidence. Uh, but learning about issues is key and trying to weave together the context and understand uh, how to solve problems, but also build relationships with the other problem solvers, whether they're the elected officials uh, or the partners on the staff who can help identify those solutions. To me, those are key priorities for an effective Congress. So you'd have them spend more time not dialing for dollars and, <laughs> right. 
And what about DC versus their home districts? You mentioned before about the importance of that, but you know, does that mean they need to be physically present in their district? You know, for a percentage of the year, you know, where would you where would you think about that? To me, that's a hard question to answer. I've I've never worked in Congress. I've worked alongside Congress for many years, and I would say it depends. Every member is different. They build relationships in different ways, and also need to maintain relationships both in their district and in Congress. So. Realistically, I would say that has to be built on the personalities and individualities of, of each member in my perspective. Great. So next question is about uh, dialogue, uh, deliberation, debate. Where should that occur in, in Congress? Should it be on the floor? Should it be in committee? Should it be in back rooms, non-transparent back rooms? You know, what is your perspective on that in particular as it relates to transparency? So as a transparency advocate, I'm a believer that we need to have a lot of discourse in a public setting. However, transparency can also stifle productive conversation. And what we know is that in order to be honest, particularly in a society that has the 24 seven media, uh, YouTube and, and social media channels that are often looking for ways to give gotcha moments on elected officials, those closed door meetings are also a very productive way to eventually lead to better transparency. So we can't immediately say a closed door meeting is by function, not transparent. What it may actually do is culminate in a compromise that solves a problem. Um, I'm a believer that you need both strategies and you can have a very effective dialogue between members of Congress in a, actual meeting. And we've been doing that since the beginning of our country. Great. And so uh, next question is really what fundamental institutional improvement should Congress make within 50 years? Congress needs uh, to make some hard looks at itself as it modernizes. And it has done this a lot in the last several years through the House Select Committee on Modernization, but also needs to implement many of those suggestions and more. This can't be a process by which we only do it every several decades. Modernization must be continuous. Got it. So a, you know, a continuous cycle of improvement uh, or a mechanism to put itself in better position each year. It's the same expectation we set for the executive branch. Yeah. All right, next question is, what book or article most shaped your thinking with respect to congressional reform? is ties to continuous improvement. Um, and this sounds like a non sequitur, but it, it actually changes the way that, or affects the way that I think about um, uh, many of these questions, a book called Black Box Thinking by Matthew Said. Uh, and it is effectively about the way that we make decisions often inside uh, uh, closed door settings, or in some cases closed loop settings, but need to have continuous feedback loops. And, uh, it is an incredible, incredibly powerful read that highlights just dozens of examples of uh, how we can do this better. Uh, I think the implications for Congress, and this is not in a critical way, are a suggestion about how we embed a continuous learning cycle in any institution, but that also includes the committees, the individual offices, and the broader institution as a whole. Excellent. Well, the last question is really about your plans. You know, what do you have, uh, you know, in uh, on the horizon for the Data Foundation and the rest of your work? So we are in the next uh, really six, 12 months, uh, very hyper focused on our continued efforts to build capacity for the officials that were created under the Evidence Act. So this includes the chief data officers, the evaluation officers. Uh, I've kind of alluded to them several times during this discussion but also specifically thinking about how they work more in collaboration with the Congress to provide the support infrastructure is very much needed across these bounds of the, of the branches of government. Uh, we believe it can be successful and it will be successful more in the long term, uh, including as Congress can help us identify what its big questions are that those who are working to uh, collect new data or analyze data, whether you're in government or outside government can uh, support. So we're, we're really laser focused on helping to build a better system as a whole. 
Thanks, well, Dr. Hart. Thank you so much for your time. Best of luck with the, uh, you know, with the evidence-based policy and all the data. And I uh, look forward to seeing what you do in the future. Thank you. Appreciate being here.